Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's also quite, I mean, I feel humbled uh, because there are so many amazing speakers. Um, and actually, all those speakers who were speaking in this room uh, did a wonderful introduction to what I will be talking about. Uh, so I hope you are ready for a bit more technical uh, talk because we will look into how to actually architect those systems uh, that should bring innovation to whatever we do. So we will look at uh, some techniques, but also some insights, because it's actually impossible to fit and squeeze all this knowledge in, in one short talk of like 30 minutes or 35. So what we will do is that I will just guide you through what you should be thinking about when you are architecting these, these systems, and also like pointing you out to some resources that you can use, and I actually advise you to use it. Um, Okay, I would be interested to know who I have in the audience. So, uh, students, hands up. Okay, people who work in software development. Wonderful. So, people who have more than five years of experience in software development. Cool, more than 10 years. That's really great. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, I'm not from Accenture, what was said. Uh, I'm from, from Masaryk University. Maybe you don't know that our faculty of informatics is actually first Slovak faculty of informatics. It is uh, actually fun fact that we have more Slovak students than Czech students. And we are really happy that you are sending the guys over. Uh, we are taking good care of them, no worries. Uh, it's actually, this was the first faculty of like IT or informatics, uh, not only in Czech Republic, Slovakia, but also in the surrounding countries, uh, actually tells a bit about the university, which is trying to bring ideas into action quite quickly. So not waiting until everybody does it to follow it, but really being the, being the leader in these things. And that also happens with uh, this like Czech Cybercrime Center of Excellence that we started some years ago. When, uh, when in 2010, we actually started recognizing that the issues that you heard about in the first block of this conference are actually need some kind of like fusion of disciplines and really systematic approach to building those systems that should take over much of the human control, actually, automate many processes and need to run really well. So we started these uh, activities. We actually started with a project, uh, which is um, kind of like education cyber range. Uh, it's a really cool project. So what we do is that we put teams of people on site and they actually really do this kind of like cyber game of trying to attack an infrastructure or secure an infrastructure. And it, it's ongoing for many, many hours. And you can really try uh, practically what, what it takes to secure a nuclear power plant that somebody else is trying to attack and what it is to be really under high pressure and being, you know, like uh, facing also some like legislation you actually need to comply to while protecting the infrastructure. So it's really not, uh, not, not an easy task. And uh, we started with this activity. We were awarded for this activity by the Ministry of Interior and then actually it built up. So we are now uh, the leading, uh, leading center of excellence on cybersecurity within our region, which means Czech Republic and surrounding, few surrounding countries maybe. Uh, we are, are part of uh, the Cybersecurity Innovation Hub. Uh, we are part of uh, Cybersecurity Competence Center. So we have some funding for um, running actually or starting uh, and funding startups and spin off uh, from the university research because uh, in the cybersecurity, we quite need a lot of research. And I'll talk about it uh, a bit. Uh, what is specific about this comparing to what you usually have in companies is that we do not do just engineering. Uh, engineering is like wonderful and it's a big part of it. And I'm like the engineering part of uh, the team. But what we need uh, is a fusion of disciplines. We need lawyers, we need social scientists, we need uh, psychologists, we need people from, from different disciplines actually. So that, that's, that's what we do. And the university is a great environment for that. Um, so we've heard about uh, advancement of digitalization. We know that uh, we are trying to like push technology into like many areas of human endeavor. And uh, what is happening is the kind of like so-called the dual use dilemma. And it's that with any technical innovation, there will be people thinking about how to use this innovation to benefit the society 
and some people who will think about how to use this innovation to harm the society. And this is something that we need to work with, and that's why with boosting the advancement of digitalization, we need to be boosting the research and development of techniques and practices to actually secure these infrastructures and to make them reliable, safe, resilient, robust, etc. So that's what we are working on, and it's actually quite a challenging context because um, the digitalization is, is, is coming really fast. So you, you saw it in the first block, it's really coming fast. And we also, on the other side, need to be really fast with reacting to it. Um, there are some challenges we are facing when developing these like protection mechanisms. And uh, these are, for example, that the world is really uh, hyper-connected now. So uh, there is a risk of cascading problems. So you can, you can have a problem and it's actually cascading to, to other sectors and that's, that's something that's happening and, and the companies are experiencing it uh, when, when, they, when they run into troubles. Uh, we have a problem with this interconnectors that you actually have many uh, untrusted devices and third party systems and components connected to the infrastructure. So the whole system actually, even if you trust um, maybe uh, the one who is developing part of the system, uh, you still do not know like what providers of technology or services they use and how trusted their supplier chain is. So you need to actually act as if the whole chain was untrusted and you need to deal with that. Uh, you need, need to deal with that, uh, the fact that you can uh, connect many things that maybe intentionally are wrong. And so in the end, what we as a, as a research center are doing is that we are developing methods and techniques for securing techniques against threats that are not existing yet. And that's something I, I call like engineering for the unknown. And what is the, what is the key principle of this engineering of the unknown is that uh, you, you actually need to uh, think about uh, problems and issues as something that will happen. And that's, that's a different mindset from the past. So in the past, we, when we were engineering systems, we were thinking about how to actually engineer them so that we avoid failures, we avoid problems, we avoid troubles. So we engineer it as well as we can. We focus on just like removing the problems from, from the whole like vision we have about its system. But what we now need to do when like engineering for the, for the unknown threats that might come in the future is that we are actually expecting that no matter how hard we try, there will be problems, there will be faults in the systems. And so we need to engineer in some mechanisms that will help you to recognize that there is a problem. Um, and let's say that you didn't recognize it. You again need to think, okay, but what if I do not recognize it? Uh, then you need to engineer in uh, some practices that actually stop the problem from propagating, that actually really stop it. Um, Let's, let's expect again that you fail. You need to do the best you can, but still expect that you fail with that and that the error keep propagating. So what do you do when, when it keeps propagating? You need to have mechanisms in place that will ensure safety of the whole system so that the system does not harm anybody or like anything serious. Uh, still, when you do that and you do your best effort, you need to expect that the system does harm. Uh, what you do then is that you need to be able to actually recover from such like disasters and, and, and fatal errors and you need to build in mechanisms that do the recovery and do the recovery as fast as possible. And then actually you need to also expect that this like all will go wrong and you need to build in mechanisms to the systems that will help you to find out what went wrong, how did it happen, who did it, how to prevent it next time. So do this like support for the investigation process afterwards. And this is like cool about the center uh, that we have, that we have lawyers really in the, in the process who tells us what as a digital evidence of a problem that happened can also be accepted by the court. When you want to actually say, okay, but there was a cyber crime and I have evidence uh, for um, you know, the group that, that caused this, this, this problem. So even this mindset of really keeping the information that will give you digital evidence and having high quality dig digital evidence that you can use uh, is, is, are these, these things and techniques we are using. So uh, there is an example uh, that uh, you um, might have heard of. It's like in 2015, there was an attack on uh, the Ukraine power grid. And this is a nice example of like how uh, 
the absence of these like steps uh, can like take down like big part of the power grid and create like big issues and big problems. So in that case, first thing is that they did not recognize that for six months uh, there is a cyber attack happening. Cyber attack, when it's like really organized, it's never like one time shot event. So it's happening for, for like half a year or the whole year. And, and it started with like um, harvesting credentials of people. And that's what's happening actually nowadays quite a lot, that people are, for example, befriending uh, stuff from the banks on the Facebook and then actually using the information they learned about them to calling their colleagues and asking credentials. So this like social engineering of harvesting credentials is something that is like ongoing for, for a long time. They were using uh, for harvesting credentials uh, some like malware uh, and like email, email things. And they were actually testing uh, the, the vulnerabilities in the system. This was ongoing for, for six months without uh, the, the uh, administration of the power grid knowing about it. Then after actually the attack happened, uh, they were not able to stop it. So what happened is actually that the operators in, in the power grid uh, were seeing the cursor on the screen just moving and switching off you know, different parts of the energy network and they were not able to do anything. So the screen was not responsive, they saw it happening, they were, they were, they were unable to do anything. So after that, actually, this, this like remote access thing locked them out, changed the password, and just keep, keep on going, and put actually 230,000 people uh, out of energy. Uh, actually, not only the people, also the, the control centers. So the control centers had backup energy, also the, uh, they were uh, cancelled and all those actually devices uh, were reprogrammed. So their firmware was, was erased and reprogrammed so that uh, the administration couldn't turn the energy up again. So you can see that actually there are like many levels on which this problem could be, could be stopped. And we need to like engineer the system so that we, we have all these levels in place. And after that, actually, for, for this uh, specific attack, it took uh, two months to recover from it. Uh, not that the people wouldn't have energy, but that the operators need to manually switch stuff on. That like the system was, was not functioning for two months properly. So we kind of got the taste of what is a critical infrastructure. Um, it's basically this like power grid. This is uh, an example. We saw some train uh, things. Um, these are any uh, infrastructures that actually can have um, quite substantial impact on the life of the people or the whole government, maybe national security. Now, when you look at some examples, there are actually many. So I have two slides of, of, of examples. Um, I will tell you which, which sectors are pretty big in this. So energy is really big. Uh, it's pretty big since actually uh, the 9-11 attack, uh, when people started to recognize that uh, the like threat of the theorist, uh, theorist uh, attack is something that can create really big issues and started to care about the like energy safety security uh, quite a lot. So since then, it's, it's, it's really huge. Um, then what's, what's really big is healthcare nowadays, because we have aging population is getting really huge in, in like different, uh, different um, areas. Really huge uh, advancement we see in transport. Uh, so in transport, uh, you see it in media. It has really good media coverage uh, with all those autonomous driving cars and also public transport, which is driverless, and uh, this like traffic lights that adapt to maybe an emergency car just arriving, et cetera. So these, these are things that are in place already. Um, also, like industry is pretty huge. So we now have manufacturing automated and with like full automation, actually remote control of this manufacturing, a lot can go wrong uh, if you do not secure these this infrastructures. Uh, and defense is actually uh, quite critical. So we have, we have like weapons uh, that uh, can be, uh, are using actually artificial intelligence to, for example, recognize from which place there is coming shooting. Because uh, when you are just there uh, and there is a shooting, you cannot recognize as a human actually from which direction the shooting is coming. But you can have artificial intelligence that tells you from which direction the shooting is coming. And then they come like policy people and discuss uh, whether this weapon should have the autonomy to start shooting back if it knows the direction or not. It, sh if sh it should be human to actually um, tell the system to start shooting back or 
the, the system can do it because the human can never verify actually whether the answer of the system is correct or not because we cannot say from which direction the shooting is coming. Um, so th these are really, really high challenges and uh, each of those, when you take, take traffic alone, is, is huge as such, like traffic is there's so many, so many different domains. Um, they all have something in common um, and it, it's actually useful because when we architect these systems, we can cross fertilize uh, the findings and actually uh, the techniques we use for architecting uh, power grids uh, can be used in architecting traffic control systems because they both have some sensors, they both have some control center, they both collect data, they both analyze it, they both have some devices with firmware that you need to update. So uh, we can actually um, bring uh, the knowledge from one domain to the other uh, and we'll just uh, discuss a bit about these like general findings. But before we do that, uh, I um, in, in, in the talk say that I will be talking about architecting the system. So let's let's just uh, stop shortly about architecture. So this is something we basically imagine when you talk about architecture, and this is actually pretty cool. So like construction engineers are much much more further than we are. So we have this they have this beautiful like three D models. I would also like to have 3D models of software architectures, actually, because software is much more complex than hardware, but we still use like 3D, uh, 2D, sorry. Uh, but essentially, actually, the analogy is pretty good um, because also when you are building a software system, you need to think about like how, to, how do you engineer uh, like different facilities uh, which have different purpose and how do you make actually some quality building the system and that's the actually architecture that is used to build in the quality because if you architect the system poorly you can hardly fine-tune the quality later on so it's really critical to architect the system well and we heard about it in the previous lecture so we will look at how we do that uh, before we do that um, this is actually how we draw architectures this like uh, 2D, uh, 2D very simplistic thing. So we do some boxes and arrows and it doesn't really matter what kind of notation you use. Uh, it's typically boxes and arrows in different, different formats. Uh, it actually uh, kind of corresponds to these blueprints of buildings where we have also in 2D like all the rooms and stuff. But actually some 10 years ago, this analogy started to be quite faulty because uh, what is the system of today? not really a blueprint of a building, but blueprint of a city. It's rather a city plan where we do not longer think about architecting system as a standalone application. We are thinking about the integration of all applications like the city does, right? When it thinks about different quarters of the city, when it thinks about roads to connecting a city, and when it thinks about decisions, whether, for example, in the city, you want to build one central hospital or multiple distributed hospitals. And when do you want to place them? Uh, which roads you need to have to actually have the inflow to people to the hospital as smooth as possible. And that's exactly what we do with architecting big infrastructures. You have many systems interacting and you need to actually uh, take in consideration all these concerns about performance, about reliability, robustness, maintainability, portability, and all these criteria. Um, it was said actually in the previous lecture, like every system has an architecture. It's not that the system wouldn't have an architecture. Maybe we do not, uh, we do not document it, we do not draw it, but it does. Sometimes it's an architecture that you can see in like folder structure in the code. Sometimes you have a blueprint, you have a picture, but in any case, you have an architecture, so this applies to everybody and every system. So what we can use actually to architect these systems? So uh, I actually picked some of these um, guidelines or uses that you can use, and I will focus on the critical infrastructures. So these systems like we, we spoke about um, into like really driving traffic control systems or the energy distribution networks uh, and similar. So, um, we will look at them one by one. Uh, I will start with a bit of like motivating example. So we saw this picture before. Uh, you can see that this is mm, like a power grid, uh, but the power grid is actually not really like a simple system that you can just take because like intuitive and naive thinking would be, 
but like power grids are the same in every country. Like, why can't I just use some template for an architecture for power grid, uh, right? So somebody has done this before, so I can just use that template and just use it in my country. And actually, this is not like too much off because we do this. We call these uh, templates reference architecture, and you can Google reference architecture for whatever system you wish. And if you do not find it on just Google, use Google Scholar. Google Scholar is a platform where you find research papers and you have access to it from the university networks uh, or any friend you have at the university can download the paper for you. Um, but there are reference architectures for everything. So you can have reference architecture for healthcare, healthcare system. You can have reference architecture for traffic control system. You can have uh, reference architecture for everything. But what's actually important to know is that uh, for many of these systems, it's not that simple that one reference architecture would be enough. If you take this example of a, of a power grid and you actually zoom in what's happening, then you find out that there are like many systems that are overlapping and happening. So what we imagine when you say a uh, smart, uh, smart grid or like power grid is that we imagine just some like smart meters in homes, maybe some like temperature control, some collection of data, and then actually just through a network, you bring the data to some, to some like central data store and you do something with it. But actually the software layer is like totally crazy complex. So it's not just this like hardware stuff. I'm myself a software person. I'm not a hardware person really. I'm, I'm a software person and I still have a lot of work to do in these systems. So when you, when you detail systems which you can find in a smart grid, you, you get these like 22 types of systems and they all overlap and they all have critical impacts. They all need to be isolated from each other. They need to work together. They work with the same data. The data needs to be somehow protected. You need to manage identity through all these systems. So it's not just one system. When you look at any critical infrastructure, and actually Smagrid is a perfect example because I would say we are like most advanced in building the smart grids and we have like most literature and, and stuff on smart grids. So you can usually use this as an inspiration for all other domains. But you have these, these so many systems. So you can see systems like advanced metering infrastructure, systems like demand response automation systems, some custom information systems, some automatic vehicle location systems, some work management systems, geographic information system. All these 22 systems need to work in coordination. But then you can actually pick one and search for reference architecture for this one. And if you are lucky, you will find it. Um, so this is one, one of those when you, when you search for reference architecture, something like this can pop up uh, and you need to then uh, actually narrow it down. So you need to decide, is this what I'm searching for? And if not, uh, what like search terms I, sh I should have to, to, to find what I, what I need. And uh, you, can, you can have like, uh, this is just an example and we'll go to, to more specific examples later. But this is, for example, an architecture that is telling you that you should have some gateways, some security gateways, and you can have security mechanisms in the gateway before you actually let the person entering your network to access some important information or functionality. You can go deeper, you can, you can uh, look into reference architectures that are actually are like telling you into like devices that tell you that, for example, the data archive need to have several levels of protection or just one, etc. So you, you get this impression from the, from the reference architectures and you also get an impression about how to organize the hardware infrastructure. Because also in the hardware infrastructure, when you are engineering these critical systems, you need to think about untrusted hardware, trusted hardware, some environments and protection on that level. So it's not enough to think just about the software. What is however important is that whatever reference architecture you find has two things already like pre-built in it. One thing is the domain and the purpose and one thing is the set of quality criteria that this reference architecture is trying to optimize. So without knowledge, knowledge of this like quality criteria and knowledge whether those are your priority or you have different priority, you cannot really use this reference architecture as such. You can use it as a baseline, but you then need to think about your quality preference and the prioritization and then like engineer actually 
these mechanisms for reliability, performance, security, testability, maintainability into the architecture you started with. So how do you do that? Um, you, can, you can start with uh, this set of criteria as the top one. I didn't know I will have such a big screen. I would give you like more of them. But uh, let's say that <laughs> we can start with them. At least we will, we will be safer with time. Um, in here, you, you see a couple of them. I would, I would point out a few information. Like one is uh, the first two lines are reliability availability. And then we have two lines, security and safety. The reliability availability, security safety, are the two ways you need to view your system when you're protecting it. The reliability availability from the perspective of unintentional troubles and security safety from the perspective of intentional troubles. And actually, there is a really nice analogy between the two, the two sets. So sometimes techniques you can use for unintentional troubles, so things that happen because of like fault that was not injected by, by intention, uh, can be used for uh, securing the systems against problems uh, that actually were injected by intention. So you, th this is really nice because there is, there is good, good analogy. You need to think of robustness and resilience because you need to recover and you need to think about how fast I am to recover, how robust my system is, etc. When we look into uh, some like key terms, so I, I love this picture. This picture is from, from a keynote of uh, Avais Rashid. Uh, Avais uh, is running a security center of excellence in uh, Lancaster University, and he's a really great guy. And uh, I love this picture. I just added the vulnerability part of it, but otherwise it's, it's his picture. Uh, you can imagine that for your system, there will be many threats. Uh, coming to the system, whether this is a fault or this is a threat. So let's stay on this intentional trouble side. But these threats need to experience like many vulnerabilities in the systems to actually re result in incidents, so in something that affects the person. What we are trying to do in engineering those systems is actually first preventing the threat from happening, but if it happens, to actually put barriers inside the system so that the end user is not aware that the system was under attack. Uh, at the university, we also have our cybersecurity uh, response team, which is protecting our university infrastructure. And I also have a team actually within uh, this infrastructure. And we are under, under like hundreds of attacks, like really on a daily basis uh, as a university infrastructure. And uh, the people, you know, like using the infrastructure do not recognize it because these are catched early on, these are dealt with. And this is actually your goal, not to make sure that the threat does not enter your system, but really make sure that if it does, it does not propagate to the end user. And you have the same analogy with the, uh, with the reliability. There is the fault and failure thing. So now I will point you out to some literature and stuff that you can use and give you some examples how, uh, how like, we can engineer these systems. So one thing we use is the tactics. Architectural tactics are a really cool thing. Uh, if you want to use them, there is a really good, good book on it. It's called Software Architecture in Practice. And it's, it's an English book, uh, but you will definitely find it. These are two pictures from there. And this, uh, what is this book doing is actually giving you uh, some tactics you need to take care about in terms of checklists. And checklists are something extremely useful in software engineering and not only software engineering, because we are just a human and what humans do is that we forget about the elementary stuff because we are so focused on the advanced stuff. So for example, what the guy I was talking about from the University of Lancaster is doing as a research uh, they built a Lego board. And this Lego board is a game that is used in the UK to educate people about security. And they run an experiment. So in this Lego board game, you have some like resources and you need to protect a system and you have like limited budget for protecting it. So you need to find a good strategy, etc. And they run a research on how different kinds of people do on this exercise. So how managers do, how students do, how security experts do, etc. And who did really creepy job were security experts. And why? Because they are so confident that they know what they should do, that they forget about elementary things. So they, they leave really elementary um, vulnerabilities in the system 
because they are so confident that they know what they are doing, that they do not question them, their decisions. So checklists are really critical. Uh, if you want to know what this is, this is actually a glove of Neil Armstrong when flying to flying to moon. Uh, it's a checklist. It's a checklist what what needs to be done. Uh, and actually, World Health Organization said that. Uh, Introducing checklists into surgery rooms reduced the mortality with critical operations for 47% because we are just human. Okay, so checklists are a great, are a great way and you can use this, this, uh, this really cool book for, for the checklist. What you will find in a checklist is actually different things that you need to think about. So just like quickly, what are those things? So if you need to think about reliability, availability and actually architecting for reliability and architecting for availability. You need to build in mechanisms for fault avoidance, fault detection, and fault tolerance. Similarly, for the, for the security, safety, and survivability of the system, you need to think about architecting the system for resistance, for recognizing that there is an attack, and for recovery from the attack. This means some principles that you can use. So there are some architectural concepts that we are using on a regular basis. So for example, we do things redundantly. So we do not rely on a single instance. Uh, even when you have an algorithm, you can have two versions of, of the algorithm and you, you can actually compare the results they give you and choose the result. Uh, you can have, th uh, you actually, what do you, what do you do? You always have odd number of them, not, not even. So you have three of them and you check the, the result, you let them vote. And if two of them agree and one didn't, then the two that agree give you the, give you the answer. So you have redundancy. You have redundancy on different levels, on hardware level, on the algorithmic level, etc. You have diversity. So if you have these multiple algorithms, you, you want to have each of them uh, programmed differently. Etc. So these are some like concepts that uh, you can have, uh, and uh, some also like tactics uh, that you can use. What is highly useful, and I recommend another book on this, uh, is the architectural patterns. For architectural patterns, you will need to search for patterns for your specific quality criteria. So you will search for security patterns, or reliability patterns, or performance patterns, etc. Uh, for security patterns, I have just a few few of them uh, on the on the slide. And what you would uh, definitely want to look at is this book, uh, which is called Security Patterns in Practice. And they are really really cool patterns, which are, for example, telling you if you have a model view controller, this is how you should secure a model view controller. This is how you should have the secure logger inside, the reference monitoring inside, some roles of the users and rights that you assign to them, some secure channels, some authentication, uh, uh, some authenticators, data sanitizers, etc. And this is really great. The, the book is full of these patterns, and not only in this sense, but also telling you. Okay, this is maybe a pattern for intrusion detection. So you are detecting that there is intrusion. And this is how you should actually program it. So not just like what is the static view of the pattern, but how you should program it. So we use this, these patterns and this is this is really great addition to uh, the checklist. And, and uh, uh, these, these as, as an example of something more because you can also do federation of these patterns. So this is, for example, for identity uh, provider because like keeping identity within the system is pretty pretty important and now you see that you have the circle of trust pattern and you have the credentials pattern and you have the whole like uh, identity provider uh, pattern as a federation of them um, we covered most of them uh, so just like as kind of a final remark um, it's also important how you choose your technologies and how you run, run your risk analysis. Uh, with, the, with the technology, you actually have many options. You have many frameworks available. But what we do, and it's a mistake, is that we select technology first, and then we tweak our architecture so that actually our technology can live happily in our system. Well, it should be the other way around. We should really think about architecting our system and then choose technology to serve us, to serve the purpose we need uh, to, to have served in the system. And as an architect, you also need to do, deal with hardware, but you have many, many um, actually guidelines to help you to select uh, the right hardware, the right network, etc. And at the end, just be aware that uh, the system can always fail. 
You need to anticipate problems. You need to anticipate errors. And so it's actually quite useful to have these taxonomies of attacks and go one by one and say, how did I protect my system against this one? And what will I do if this attack happens and is successful anyway? That's it, what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I kept a few minutes for the questions, uh, so I hope to get one from you. Uh, and thank you very much for the attention. There you go. And you have some questions. I think you have two serious questions, and then we have Brad Pitt. Then <laughs> he's joining. So, shall I read go it? Go ahead, I can, yeah. Yes. So, how can regulators, governments, etc., uh, become better at engineering for the unknown, exploring the unknown things? Okay, so for the, for the regulation, we have uh, the like ICT law department, uh, and they are like, um, really progressive and working on it, but it's still going crazy slow. So it's actually on the, the, on the whole EU level, uh, the regulation against these, these problems is very, very slow. What is, what is actually a good thing uh, that or there are different group, uh, kind of like expert groups happening and giving at least recommendations? And what I see is that the governments are often listening to these recommendations, even if the legislation and the regulation is not actually taking care of these stuff. So what's happening is that one thing is that what must be done and it's in the regulatory systems and then there is like recommendations uh, which are going along. They, it would take ages for them to get inside this like really like formal stuff, uh, but people follow them. Um, uh, the second, how does cloud affect the reference security architecture? Uh, if everyone is on the same cloud, it is a single point of failure. Cloud by itself is not really a single point of failure, so we, we do a lot of stuff within the cloud not to be a single point of failure, so it's like highly distributed environment and it's, it's like really well uh, done and secured. I don't know if you've ever seen how a cloud uh, site looks like, it's like pretty amazing. So definitely Google it if you haven't seen it, but you really have the whole army uh, in there, like really army. Uh, with tanks and you know like this this like army army stuff and many uh, many levels of like physical protection for the infrastructure and also also on the level of actually isolating different parts of the cloud uh, in the cloud what companies are doing actually is that they have isolation so you have isolation of uh, some parts what now cloud providers are doing also that they are trying to give you the ability to know where the data center that you are using is located because there are some regulations for example for the us that the data in critical systems cannot leave the us so even if they store it with like amazon or microsoft uh, they want to make sure that the data is stored on the servers in within the us so uh, they are now like this is something that like the cloud providers needed to do to adapt to uh, the requirements on the national security level, uh, but the protection is like pretty good. What is the problem actually with the cloud is is another thing, and that is that uh, you usually running your request across like many servers, which means that one of the servers can just uh, fall down. It it can just like go down. And in this case, actually, it's not a problem like in, in a few milliseconds, it's up again and your request is running again. But if your handling in the software does not recognize that within the execution of a few operations within the series, one of them maybe didn't uh, operate or like execute correctly because the server was down for, for a few milliseconds, you get a problem that is propagating through the system without you recognizing. So really you need to, as a software engineering, as a software engineer, when you engineer applications for the cloud, this is, this is an issue. You really need to know that maybe something didn't go, go right and that you need to roll back and you need to actually recover uh, even if you actually didn't even realize. Okay. That's exactly what I was going to say to that question. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool you have a compliment from belgium because i took a picture from your slides and i sent it to a friend of mine who's in it uh and i said to me just words and he sent back he said because that's because you're an idiot this actually makes a lot of sense so <laughs> even your compliments from belgium ladies and gentlemen it's time for lunch thank you very much give a round of applause by Bora bunova thank, thank you, you.